It, it is possible to make a kind of simple back of an envelope model of a live self-regulating self Earth using Gaia theory. And I made one in 1994 and published it in the journal Nature. All I did was to imagine a simple planet that went round a star just like the sun and had plants on the land and algae living in the oceans and consumers that, that ate the plants and algae. The plants were assumed to remove carbon dioxide from the air and the con consumers to return it again. And uh, the, both the plants and the algae were assumed to produce chemicals and agents that encouraged cloud formation or change the albedo of the planet and so regulated the temperature. The effect of temperature on the rate of growth of plants and algae was taken in this model from real Earth observation. And the climate of the model was taken by the regular equations of geophysics uh, that the IPCC uses. This one shows you the, a comparison of the predictions of the IPCC, that black line, solid line, which is the average of the best models of the Hadley Center. And you can see some hefty differences. The, the a model of a live Earth means that the whole system is quite a powerful amplifier, and any small fluctuation or change tends to be amplified with time. And the experiment done in the simple model was to add CO2 just as we are doing in the real planet to try and mimic what the IPCC curve was trying to, to predict. And the, but the biggest difference is that instead of continuously warming as you add more and more CO2 until it looks to me uh, after 2100 it's just going to run away uh, to impossible temperatures, instead of that the temperature goes along fluctuating more and more until after one major fluctuation suddenly jumps to a, a, a considerably hotter state. But after it jumps, it stays stable and regulates. Now, this fits in very well with the Earth's own history. There was a change similar to the one we've been making 55 million years ago when uh, two million million tons of carbon dioxide was added to the atmosphere of the Earth. And temperatures rose to the point that in the polar regions, the polar ocean was as high as in the 70s Fahrenheit. And crocodiles were living in the uh, polar waters, uh, not polar bears as now. The other important thing about this type of model is it's irreversible. Once you make the jump, and even before it, it's no use pulling the CO2 back. It doesn't stop the rise. It stays there. There's another bit of evidence that is in favor of the Gaia type of model. And you can see, as we came out of the Ice Age, it didn't go up as a smooth, steady rise. It, first, it started wobbling like mad, fell right back to quite a low temperature, and then suddenly took off to a steady state again. And this is the way, much more the way the Earth works. It doesn't work with smooth curves. It works by a series of jerks and jumps. And that diagram is particularly worrying at the moment because the very steep jump uh, just before 10,000 uh, years ago, that sudden jump up was hypothecated as being caused by the permafrost melting and uh, methane gas being released into the atmosphere. As the ice is melting in the north, the permafrost is melting with it, and we're approaching a point where if the same happens as happened then, one can expect this sudden jump to higher levels uh, to occur. I find it extraordinary that climate scientists could have put their names to predictions as far ahead as the middle of this century in the face of all of these great uncertainties. I know that they are wise, competent, and principled, so what made them persist with what may be the wrong kind of climate model and assume that their forecasts were good enough for policy? One answer may be that they had no option. You see, having persuaded governments that large and extremely expensive modeling centers what you might call the battleships 
of climate war of the climate war were needed. They just had to sail in them and hope for the best. And all this is compounded everywhere by government and research funders cutting back funds for observation and spending instead on ever more complicated computers and the facilities that go with them. I've lived long enough to see this happen and often wonder what a modern grant funding agency would have done is that if a, a student had come along called Charles Darwin with a proposal to sail around the world somewhat vaguely looking at life to see if he could think how it evolved, I'm sure he would not have been supported. Now, I don't mean that models are not needed, just that we must never lose sight of the true basis of science. Nature is always the final arbiter of ideas and must be tested in the real world. The virtual world of models is always hypothetical until the test is made. Our minds are now on the economic, not the climate crisis, and as 2009 proceeds, are likely to be more so. But as the recession uh, may be the source of human misery, it will force a closer look at the conduct of science, because there won't be so much money for it. The need to retrench may also ma make us look more closely at extravagant attempts to improve our carbon footprints and make us wonder if those fe frequent pilgrimage to Kyoto, Bali and other places are really needed. They do nothing for the Earth, nor does political pressure for uh, renewable or alternative energy, which is a bit like alternative medicine, a nostrum for minor ailments, but rarely the cure for serious disease. Of course we'd better stop burning fossil fuel at an excessive rate and equally importantly, reduce the area of the natural world we use for ourselves. But our main task, should global heat, heating continue, is to prepare to adapt and survive. The Earth system Gaia has survived far worse insults than industrialized humans and will almost certainly save itself. <laughs>